Hi everybody, I'm Laura Houston. I'd like to welcome you to our first ever Anaheim Elementary School District Scholar Talks. So what is a Scholar Talk? Well, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a scholar giving a talk about a subject. Now the students who you will listen to today got to choose their own subjects. Their assignment was share something important to you. That's it, any topic, any subject, share something important to you. So as you sit here and listen, I ask you to think to yourself, what would I share about what's important to me? Or what would I give a scholar talk about? It may be you up here on the stage next year. So um, I'd like to introduce our first scholar. It is Ivy, and Ivy is a sixth grader from Anaheim Elementary Online Academy, and her talk is called The Origin of the Tooth Fairy. Now, as a kid, you've probably been told by your parents that when you lose your baby teeth, instead of leaving it around to do nothing, you put it under your pillow. As you sleep, a fairy will whisk in through the window and take the tooth from under it. The next morning, a couple of bucks will be in place of your lost tooth. That fairy, you may have figured, is the tooth fairy. After surviving the pain of each dental appointment after another, I was pretty much healthily believing all of it. I'd asked my mom to keep the window ajar and even wrote a little note, brought together with a little drawing of the Tooth Fairy and I. For some reason, I did picture her having very long Rapunzel-like hair. I don't have the original note now, unfortunately, but it probably looks something like this. As I've grown older, I've realized the heavy, harsh truth, and my mind often grieved about the loss of all my hopes and dreams of being a tooth fairy. But that also meant I had to experience how my parents tried to keep that belief alive in my little brother. Whenever he'd question the tooth fairy's existence, I'd wince, then remind him that the tooth fairy lived on Pluto. I made that up, that way there'd be a very less likely chance he'd ever try to visit the tooth fairy. But now I question, why it's tradition to for parents to talk to their children into believing in the tooth fairy. I decided to study a bit about it, and it turns out 5th to 15th century Vikings often paid children for their lost teeth because it was believed that they would bring good luck in battle. This practice was called tond fe, and the teeth were worn on necklaces. In Spanish-speaking countries, the tooth fairy is a mouse named Perez, who basically does what our modern tooth fairy does, replace children's teeth with rewards, except his rewards are simply gifts instead of money. I see this had an absolute win because you don't have to actually spend the money and it's more of a surprise. Later on, Lillian Brown wrote an article in 1908 giving new parents a suggestion on making children less hesitant about teeth removal. That was how the Tooth Fairy became a part of our childhoods. Although the tale of the Tooth Fairy is often considered a childhood memory to treasure for a lifetime, I think it's important too. It's a good way of seeing the bright side of bad situations. Oh, you lost your baby tooth? Congrats! You get money from the fairy of teeth. Maybe the tooth fairy won't visit you every time you lose your teeth, but at least you learned how to make a good situation out of the bad. And in turn, you get money and a fairy friend who you know doesn't exist. Who knew the tooth fairy did so much more than give you money every time you lose your baby teeth? And now, you know it too. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ivy. I thoroughly enjoyed that and learned something about the Tooth Fairy and the origin of the Tooth Fairy. Next, I'd like to introduce Grant. And Grant is a sixth grader from Barton Elementary School. And he is going to talk with us about the history of cats. So welcome, Grant.
What are cats? Cats are cute, fluffy animals that live in many people's houses, right? Well, this is not always the case, and cats' wild siblings, such as lions, tigers, and jaguars, used to never have their fluffy friends living with us. So, how did cats come to where they are today? Please listen if you want to hear about the history of cats. The first part of cat's history is their evolution, or at least a rough timeline of it. It was around 10 to 15 million years ago that the first cats started to come into existence. And the first wild cats that are still around with us today came into existence around 6.4 million years ago, such as lions, tigers, jaguars, panthers, and cougars. This is the first part in the history of cats. The next part in the history of cats is their domestication. The first domesticated cats started to appear around 3.4 million years ago. However, it would be a long jump from that point in time to when they were actually domesticated, 8,000 to 10,000 years ago by ancient Egyptians. The Egyptians considered these cats as gods and worshipped them, which somehow led us to where we are today. The last part of the history of cats is why they are so popular, and it's actually because of how they evolved. Cats are self-reliant. They'll probably know what to do most of the time around your house, but they can still care for you. They will still love you, and you can practically pet them to your heart's content. With all these crates, I can see no future where cats were not happily living beside us. Now you, now you have learned about the history of cats, some of their evolution, a bit of their domestication, and a part of the reason why they're so popular. I hope that you have learned something about our loving fluffy friend, the cat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grant, for teaching us about cats. I am definitely a cat lady, and I still learned a lot from your speech, so good job and thank you. So next, I'd like to introduce Natalie, and Natalie is a sixth grader from Edison Elementary School, and she is going to talk about the very important subject of the school to prison pipeline. Welcome, Natalie. While awaiting her sentence last May, Grace, a 15-year-old black student, was incarcerated for 78 days due to not completing her homework. Judge Mary Ellen Brennan says she found Grace guilty of failure to submit to any schoolwork and getting up for school, and that she was a threat to the community. Last May, we were all learning to adapt to the changes of distance learning due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I want you to think for a second how it was and has been for you to adapt to distance learning. For me, the most difficult part was that I couldn't see my friends every day. Luckily, I was able to, to successfully adapt to distance learning. Although it might have been more difficult for Grace, as she has Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, otherwise known as ADHD. Individuals with ADHD typically have limited attention and might display hyperactivity. Grace states that she felt unmotivated and without live instructions. She had difficulties keeping herself on track. Although this happened one year ago, this is not coming to an end. For instance, an 11-year-old boy named Abraham was handcuffed and sent to a juvenile detention center because of an emotional episode. Same with an 8-year-old student who was handcuffed due to his behavior. Students are being funneled out of school and end up in the criminal justice system and labeled as a criminal. Many of these students have disabilities and are black students or students of color. Instead of providing the student with proper help, they are being punished and pushed out of school. Hi, my name is Natalie. I'm a student at Thomas Edison, and I'm here to spread awareness about the school to prison pipeline and provide future directions for what we can do to disassemble it. 
Before I go into further detail about the pipeline, I will make my best attempt to explain this in a simple manner as this topic is complex given the various factors that contribute to it. One factor that contributes to the pipeline are zero tolerance policies, which allow school officials to punish a student when certain rules are broken. The zero tolerance policies don't state what counts as a serious offense and a non-serious offense. Even so, under these policies, students receive harsher punishments, such as suspensions and expulsions. These structures of codes and punishments criminalize certain students and it increases the chances for the student to end up in the criminal justice system. Once involved in the system, students are 67% more likely to end up in jail again before they are 25. Black students receive harsher punishments when compared to the white peers, even if they committed the same offense. For example, one study showed that compared to white students, black students are seen as troublemakers and their behavior was considered more severe, even if their white peer engaged the same behavior. Further, students with disabilities also receive harsher punishments than students without disabilities. Given this information, the school to prison pipeline is the idea of students being funneled, funneled out of school due to policies and disciplinary actions taken based on race, gender, and disability. Many of these students are isolated from the opportunity to have a meaningful and educational experience. In order to dismantle the pipeline, several steps can be taken. Although I provided you with a brief overview of it, as I mentioned previously, it is complex as several factors contribute to it. I believe that social emotional learning can help students not only behaviorally, but emotionally and mentally. Social emotional learning teaches us how to develop skills that can help us manage and cope with feelings or situations. Having strong social emotional skills can lead to better relationships, self-awareness, and self-control. And self-control. And self-control. Eventually, this can decrease suspensions and expulsions. Social emotional learning is a, type, is a type of restorative practice. Restorative practices are processes used to dynamically build positive and strong relationships, resolve conflict, confront the needs of the school, and resolve and repair harm. Restorative practices can help students with academic difficulties. It can, it can reduce the amount of students that drop out of school and it can lessen the absences in school. Moreover, these practices can help students with psychological trauma and ultimately begin to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. From what you have listened and learned, it is clear that there is a lot to do, but together we can create a change. Thank you all for listening and I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you, Natalie, for talking about that very important subject. And I especially loved your one of your solutions of the importance for social emotional learning. I'm a big proponent of that myself. So thank you. So next, I am very happy to introduce Delilah, a sixth grader at Franklin Elementary School. And she will speak to the topic of imagination. According to the importance of imagination, it makes our entire existence. How? Well, it's because of imagination we have books, movies, Imagination will often carry us to worlds that never were, but without it, we go nowhere. Carl Sagan. Imagine something that you love. It could be anything, like a book, movie, or music. Then it's gone. 
Why? Well, it's because without our imaginations, we wouldn't have anything. Hi, my name is Delilah. Today I'll be talking about imagination. According to the importance of imagination, it makes our entire existence. How? Well, it's because of imagination we have books, movies, art, and music. For example, my favorite book is the Harry Potter series. Technology is something we use every day, but have you ever wondered who we should thank for imagining these possibilities? There are many people who invented the things we love. Whatever you want to be, people dreamed and imagined. Life would be plain and boring without our imaginations. How does imagining things help us? Well, it helps us by exploring the past. We read books and imagine the stories in our heads because we understand that way. Even with music, sometimes I can relate to some songs. We can express ourselves by our imagination. We can even imagine our future as well. Imagination is important in our mental health and it's very powerful in many ways. If we think of the impossible, we would be those people who invented books, movies, and art because the world can use many more ways to live. We can express ourselves by our mind. We can even imagine our future. We can make history if we imagine possibilities. Who knows, maybe you could be the next J.K. Rowling, the person who wrote Harry Potter. But if you're going to imagine a plan, write it down. And if more ideas come, write it down. Do you think knowledge is more important than imagination? Well, maybe. But with some research, I found out that imagination is the highest freedom of all. For example, the world is scary right now, but I escaped this pandemic and imagined a different world. But knowledge is limited. With imagination, we can embrace the entire world. Imagination is a power to think in a way which sometimes we don't understand. Many people will say that will never be real, or people will never use that in their lives. But the people who invented the things we love today got told that a lot in their lives. I am imagining a world of possibilities. So to five or 10 years from now, I might be Delilah the author or the writer. So remember this speech. Here is what I'm leaving you with today. Imagine, plan, and change the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Delilah. Uh, your speech was truly beautiful. It really was. Next, I am very happy to introduce Desiree. Desiree is a fifth grader at Gwyn Elementary School, and the topic of her speech is Eagle Pride. Hello, my name is Desiree Zavala. I am 11 years old and I'm going to be representing James Gordon Elementary. I would first start off by sharing my journey. My mom left me when I was six months old. My dad died three years ago. My auntie is now my mom and she moved to Anaheim to buy a bigger house to get my own room. Now I am a part of the Anaheim School District. Well, when it first started, when I walked into the front office, my mom grabbed my hand and we were going to her classroom. I was very nervous and scared. And I was, at that moment, I was very scared because I had butterflies in my stomach and I didn't know if people would accept me for the person I am and people wouldn't accept me for how tall or big or how short I was. But I was wrong about that. Then this happened. I found out I had the best support system in Anaheim. No matter if I was mad, angry, sad, my counselor will always have time for me. She always let me know that no matter how your emotion takes over, you're going to be fine. And she taught me that it's okay to be mad, sad, or angry. I also found out that 
James Gwynn Elementary is the best school in Anaheim for my eyes. They always showed me love, support, and always gave me the extra hours of knowledge to teach me. They always did everything. If I was either struggling through something or if I was having a tough time, they would always let me know that no matter how I felt, they were always going to give me a pat in the back. At last, Here's something, Miss Glancy, I had a teacher when I was in fourth grade. Miss Glancy always used to let me know that no matter if I was going through a hard time and I was struggling, she even believed in me. Like one time I was struggling with the math test and she gave me the knowledge and believed in the power of a button. And it might just be a button to you guys, but. It's a button that gave me the extra mile that helped me. That school made me feel worthy. It made me feel smart. It made me feel proud of myself. I would be honored to say that when I go to South Junior High, I will soar my wings like an eagle, and I would be very smart, and I will continue flying for my dreams, and I would be a smart eagle and I won't quit. My name is Desiree Zavala. I am 11 years old, and today's topic was representing James Glenn Elementary. Um, at this time, um, I think it's okay, audience, if we all give a huge round of applause for all of our speakers. And um, that last speech was just as beautiful. I brought me to tears. It was, it was just amazing. Um, we will be live streaming every day this week at 1.30. And also, this live stream will stay up on the AESD YouTube channel so you can watch it for months and months. Um, I want to thank all of the students and the teachers and the administrators and the parents uh, for bringing your students here today and for helping uh, your children uh, with, edu with their education. Um, I just, I loved this first episode of Scholar Talks. Did all of you? Yeah. Thank you very much. And I will see you tomorrow at the same time with five new speeches. Bye-bye.